conservation isn't something which can be achieved overnight. It's not just a question of um, picking up bricks and mortar and wandering on to the site and starting restoration. There's a lot of work that has to go on in the background before you get to that stage. What really counts is, is timing. Timing the moves of the game. If you make your move at the right moment, you stand ever so much more chance of catching each opportunity as it goes, of really helping the place you're trying to serve. Chester from the River Dee. The Romans built a fortress here, Diva. Medieval merchants traded here from a flourishing river port. Present day Chester shows its origins. The old Roman wall survives. With some later medieval additions, it still encloses the historic central area of the city, with the River Dee to the south. Crossing the river and through Watergate, Northgate and Eastgate, run four Roman streets to meet in the centre at the cross by the site of the Roman garrison headquarters. In 1966, this area was a subject of a conservation study, jointly commissioned by government and the local authority. The hope was that in looking for solutions to conservation problems in a particular historic town, some more general lessons might be learnt. The first lesson was character assessment. Finding out what makes up the unique character of the densely packed 200 acres which is the centre of Chester. The different sorts of buildings which are ringed by these historic walls. In pride of place, the cathedral an architectural treasure of national importance. A 14th century gateway leads to quiet Georgian dignity. The well-preserved houses here in Abbey Square, next to the cathedral, are of major importance to Chester's townscape. Across the way is civic pride, the town hall, a portly monument to Victorian aspirations and prosperity. Much less well-to-do, the Dutch houses, a 17th century building in a sad state of disrepair and in imminent danger of collapse. And here's what the tourists flock to photograph, the rose, Chester's most famous and unique feature. Shops at street level with a covered walkway above and more shops. Best of all, people use it for walking and shopping. It's not just a playground for instamatics. A surprise. Behind the ancient picturesque, a busy modern shopping precinct has cunningly been built. Another surprise. Behind St. Peter's Church, tucked away, is a tiny quiet courtyard, a retreat from city bustle. It's not all pretty pretty. There are muddy puddles here like anywhere else, and ordinary bits, and houses that aren't anything special and gap sites that are waiting to be filled. These neglected 17th and 18th century houses and cottages in King Street are a mixed bunch, but together they combine into an attractive period street, and the loss of one or two of them would spoil its character. That's what character is about. It's the way individual features combine. 
Getting to know a place, the feel of it, involves looking at it closely. The team of architectural consultants, Donald Insull and Associates, spent nearly two years looking very closely indeed at Chester. They met and talked to the owners of its buildings, and they made detailed surveys of their condition. Five Castle Street, the decay at the bottom of the doorway, probably related to the general trouble in the wall above, and there's a big bulge in the wall at midpoint with a good deal of open jointing and decay of the joinery altogether. The top parapet has been rebuilt in recent years rather badly with machine-made bricks. Uh, this ideally needs to be taken off and redone more sympathetically. Insull himself recalls the work and the publication of his report. In Chester, we had a look at over 400 buildings in some considerable detail, and we did our best to see their individual opportunities and uh, the way in which they could best be helped for the future, what their structural condition was, what it would cost to fix them up, if you like. And we uh, collated all this information into um, a report, but trying to be sure that this report was a useful action document and, and, and not just another book to sit on a shelf somewhere and, and, and moulder away. It was, it was intended really to be useful and used. So, to this end, we prepared a, a programme as part of our study, a programme over years, a timed programme, and a costed programme, in which we tried to allocate jobs to people, we tried to see each thing that needed doing, uh, in the light that it would be useless unless there was somebody there to do it. So we tried to say who would do everything. We uh, tried to see the opportunities, the positive opportunities that were there to be released, whether they were obvious or not, and to weld together a programme which could be carried into effect uh, as a team activity. One of the most interesting things we found was the way in which the um, vitality of some parts of the city had been sapped away uh, into others. The arrival of the new shopping precinct, which is splendid, it, 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 it integrates beautifully with the centre of the city, but this had, uh, in the very nature of things, drained a lot of life from other parts, uh, as, for example, the Bridgegate area. Another problem has been um, the draining uh, of life from the upper floors of, of many of the buildings, because uh, no shop uh, wants people constantly trekking through itself uh, to a flat above, and the result almost always tends to be empty top floors, neglect, uh, and very often, neglect until water comes right down through into the shop. The city invited us to come back more recently and to prepare a careful and more detailed study of one specific area. For this purpose, they chose the Bridgegate area, which was in fact one of the most rundown of the lot and presented many of the worst problems. It was a sad, uncertain area in which nobody felt happy about doing much to his own property and there was a great feeling of, of uncertainty and doubt. This, this yeah. last one yes, here? Yes, the last one. Oh, we're still waiting for a if conservation could succeed in Bridgegate, it could surely succeed anywhere. This will be the last one to be uh, completed. What's the time scale of getting the people? In 1971, Chester appointed a conservation officer. It was the first place in the country to have one. How does Roger Tilley see his job? I think, as I see the role of a conservation officer, is the link between the local authority and the 
members of the public, uh, owners, occupiers of the listed buildings in the town. It really acts as um, a point of contact um, between the local authority and, and, and the people I've mentioned. Uh, it also goes further than that in that obviously we can offer, I can offer technical advice on how to restore buildings and also where to get the cash from to enable people to do this. Well, starting from, well, you'd be employing a, a local Something architect who would be working to the drawing, um, the basic drawings that uh, Donald Insel has prepared, uh, and then he'll work up from those specifications and detailed drawings. In fact, it's at the back of number one Gamble Place there. And it runs through. Under Gamel Terrace. Is Chester unique in needing a conservation officer? There's a need in any historic city, historic village, historic town or whatever, uh, for someone to act as this point of contact, someone with an interest, a focal point. Um, you can call him a conservation officer or, or nosy parker or whatever you like, but there's a need for someone like that in, in, in every um, historic setting. Um, so I certainly think that it shouldn't just be thought that um, uh, Chester is unique in having a conservation officer. The need is there and really ought to be fulfilled if conservation um, in action to get things done is in fact going to, um, don't, going to progress. If the conservation programme is to be successful, then it does depend largely on the cooperation that's achieved between the local authority and people that are carrying out restoration work or um, improving their properties. We're fortunate in Chester in that we do have this cooperation. And we also have a conservation area advisory committee, which is a committee formed of representatives from about a dozen or so local amenity societies in the town. And they act as the focal point of opinion uh, from their various societies, and they're then able to put their opinions and comments forward um, for us to act upon, and also for the local authority to seek their advice on certain specialist matters. Halfway down Lower Bridge Street, in the middle of the depressed Bridgegate area, the action programme has started on an important conservation project. This is Gamel House. Gamel House is basically a 17th century Jacobean hall. It was built as part of the much larger building known as Gamel House, which was the home of Sir Francis Gamel. We have all the usual trimmings and uh, of a Jacobean hall, the very fine stone fireplace, and the carved timber frieze around the, the top of the wall. We feel very strongly that the main hall, with its Jacobean features, should in fact be a public place where members of the public have reasonably free access and it's proposed that this part of the building be used for an exhibition hall. The restoration scheme was being financed jointly by the City Council and through the Department of the Environment through the Town Scheme. Uh, obviously the, the Council as owner of the building have to make their contribution but we are using Town Scheme money from Central Government and Conservation Fund money from the City Council. Behind Gamel House is another of the city's surprises, an unexpected backwater, Gamel Place. Gamel Place is a little courtyard of 19th century cottages, um, originally built as part of the castle for the army. And again, as part of the deal in purchasing Gamel House, the city council purchased Gamel Place. The buildings are structurally sound, but lacked basic amenities. The city council decided that they would improve the properties as part of a general improvement area so that not only would grants be attracted for the house improvement but also grants obtained for landscaping and environmental works. This scruffy patch of waste ground will be turned into a garden for the tenants. Local school children volunteered to help. It's also an example of local authority housing money being used to support conservation. Up the street, still in the Bridgegate area, a developer is parting with his cash to help these once splendid frontages, not out of sentiment, but as an investment. He owns the gap site and the properties, and he's been given planning permission to put up an infill office development to a design approved by the council, and to demolish the less valuable buildings, because not everything is worth conserving. As a quid pro quo, the developer has undertaken to retain and restore the historic frontages of the three most important buildings in the group. So, the injection of money from the private sector helps to eke out public funds.
St. Michael's, an important landmark in the city, is one of several redundant churches in Chester. A valuable building, but to justify its preservation, a new use needs to be found for it. Using the local conservation fund and with grant aid, plans are in hand to turn it into a visitor centre where tourists can learn something of the background to Chester's conservation programme. Roger Tilly reports progress to members of the planning committee. This will be um, a multi-projector show where you have four or six projectors either in line or in groups with these three um, screens on the top and three on the bottom. And this will be probably a 10 minute show um, which will then run through conservation in Chester and the way in which the programme has been building up in the various aspects of conservation in the city. Giving people brief introduction really and why it's necessary in Chester to have conservation anyhow. From there, uh, we come out underneath the arches, as it were, into this conservation section, which will try to develop some of the theme in slightly more detail that have been picked up in this area. And, for example, we're looking at showing the Dutch houses as being one example of the complex nature of a restoration scheme, and just the various things which go into it, and where the local authority has to come in to assist in all sorts of ways. We're also looking at the possibility of putting on um, a display of materials which one finds in, in the restoration of buildings, of, of old buildings. And from there we move into this area at the back here, which is shown as a bridge gate area, which will be very much um, a sort of time span, covering right from the early install report and survey in 66, right the way up to 1975, so that we should be able to see on one continuous display the sequence of events and the way in which um, the consultant has worked with the council on the various problems that have cropped up, how they've been solved, to give the story of the Bridgegate action area. Work is also in progress on the Dutch houses. Three houses make up the one building, amongst the earliest in Bridge Street. Inside, the Carolean plaster ceiling will be restored. Part of the building has been acquired by the council to simplify a complex ownership situation. Part is privately owned, but the restoration scheme is a joint effort. The front wall and will be replaced in the original 17th century style. And it's hoped that the upper floors will be made into flats, in line with a policy of bringing people back to live in the centre of the city. Across the road, a craftsman is at work. They are fast disappearing, and conservation cannot be achieved without such men. We're fortunate in that um, there are a number of craftsmen still working in Chester, but I think that this is a problem which um, is shown throughout the country and that people are leaving the traditional skills of masonry, good quality joinery, um, good quality bricklaying and plaster work because they can obtain higher wages in, in other forms of industry. Certainly we've been lucky on St Michael's Rectory in being able to find craftsmen who could carry out this sort of work and the results speak for themselves in a way in that here we have a timber frame building reinstated as a timber frame building and built largely in the traditional forms uh, that this would have been built in the Middle Ages. St Peter's Churchyard right in the heart of the city centre and here we're doing really two exercises. One exercise being the restoration of two quite important buildings which in themselves will be converted and restored into office commercial and to additional hotel accommodation and linked with that we're carrying out an environmental improvement scheme in the courtyard to provide for better lighting, uh, better seating so that people can in fact enjoy this quiet spot right in the heart of the city. The old Northgate Brewery was demolished as part of a comprehensive plan for the whole Northgate area. The idea was to build office accommodation on the front of the site with residential accommodation behind. It really was an interesting piece of design in that we had a gap site between the Victorian fire station and the Victorian public house which had to have an infill building designed for it. The granting of planning consent was in a way a carrot and stick exercise because what the council wanted to see was the small cottages in King Street restored and improved and brought back to life as housing accommodation. But it really has all been part of an overall plan 
of obviously allowing a developer to realise his economic involvement in the construction of the office block, but still allow a return to the community in a way by restoring and improving houses in the area. Traffic erodes the character of a place and penalises the pedestrian. The problem is a daunting one, but it's a nettle that must be grasped sooner or later. The completion of Chester's Ring Road made it possible for the city to introduce a traffic management scheme in the historic centre. Except for buses and access vehicles, through traffic was kept out, and the area in front of the town hall was partly pedestrianised. People began to enjoy their streets again. Chester's ratepayers currently contribute £100,000 a year to the city's conservation fund and feel that it's money well spent. The Department of Environment also makes substantial payments in the form of various grants towards the cost of conservation. Chester has learnt the conservation game and is getting good results. Gamel House. The Dutch Houses. St Michael's Church. Just a few examples, but the principles which work in Chester can be applied anywhere. To look at a place that's the first principle. Study it closely and discover its overall character. Because the object of conservation is to enhance character. Secondly, survey the condition of buildings and groups of buildings. Thirdly, think about money and make the most of all sources of help. From central government, local government, and from the private sector. Fourth, appoint a conservation action man, someone to be responsible for coordinating the effort, for oiling the wheels of partnership. With these ground rules, anyone, anywhere, can win the conservation game.